So, 2 Chronicles chapter 12, a study through the book of 1 Chronicles. <laughs> Who does these presentations? I do. Yeah. Blame it on the Parkinson's. I don't know. <laughs> I, you, you know my slides are never creative to begin with. They're just for the Christians who forget to bring their Bible to. So, <clears throat> my gosh, can you believe it? <clears throat> so we're going to start this week and next week going through chapter number 12. And you remember, as we've gone back, King David was the, the one who really brought Israel to its high point. He had many struggles and um, he had many ups and he had many downs, but he was a man after God's own heart. And you and I should take great peace from knowing that God redeems failures <laughs> because you're far worse than you know. He loves us. And then King David had a, uh, many sons, but he had one son who became the the king after him, and that was his son from Bathsheba, whom he had an affair, and he killed her husband. It's a great group of people in the Bible. <laughs> and Solomon really not only unified the kingdom, expanded it, made it really rich, but then he got off track and uh, found a fondness for many women and for many philosophies, and it ended in trouble, and he'd really become pride uh, proud and, and foolish. And then his son, Rehoboam, inherits the riches of his father, but he inherited also pride and foolishness from his father. And he's, he leads the nation, and this, there's a rebellion, and then there becomes an Israel and a Judah, and, or the northern and the southern kingdom. And it just made me think, you know, gosh, um, this inheritance thing is a big deal. Because most of us live on a treadmill of performing, trying to achieve. But what is, what is it about an inheritance? An inheritance is a gift you receive that kind of flows from relationship. You can't say, I deserve... Or you can't demand an inheritance. Inheritance is a gift. And here is this king. He's the grandson of David. He has inherited great wealth and all that, that he could ever want. And here it is available. And he inherits and he doesn't experience it because of his pride. And you know, he refused to walk with the Lord. And then I started thinking, you know, a lot of Christians are like that. They, they, they inherit all in Jesus Christ, and yet they don't appropriate it. Why? Because we refuse to walk in the Spirit, refuse to walk in humility. And then, I, you know, this is just another little thing that hit me was like, you know, pride is this really wicked sin. Everybody, when you think of David, what sin do you think of? You think of Bathsheba. Right? And, and, and I'm not making light of his sin with Bathsheba. It's pretty disgusting that you would sleep with your neighbor's wife and then have him killed to cover it up. I mean, this is not pretty. But you know what sin caused more harm in the kingdom of God? Was his sin of pride in counting the troops of Israel. And I think, and I don't know, but it just, I think... That Okay, I'm going to qualify it, okay? Because I'm going to get in trouble. I'll get an email on this one. I, think, I was going to say, I think pride's got to be one of the worst sins. And then someone would send me an email and say, sin is sin, which I know. <laughs> and all sin is sin. Well, we got it, right? So, like, your sin is no worse or better than someone else's sin. So no one should be messing around with other people's sin. But... We allow this religious pride. And so what I'm saying is that, yes, I know, but pride causes more harm than many other sins because pride puts you in opposition to God and appropriates you. And there's probably nothing worse than religious pride. 
Now, you can see it in the unbelieving world, you know, you're like, it's just like obvious. But religiously proud people are the scary people. You know why they're the scary people? Because they think they're better than other people, and they've got the Bible to prove it. But pride puts us in opposition to God. And we're called to be a people who live not by what we do, not by what we achieve, but we're a people who live in our inheritance. And an inheritance is something that you receive. And do you realize, friends, this morning that you and I receive everything we have because of faith through grace in the finished work of the cross? I mean, we were talking about it in... um, in Sunday school, in, in going through the book of Hebrews, uh, and it's an incredible passage, but I, I just keep thinking, man, all those years of religion where I was told, you better get right. I spent all my time getting right with God, only to discover that I was right. <laughs> and what was it? It was inheritance. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 30 says, man, you are right. You're right. You're righteous and sanctified and redeemed, and you have wisdom from God. And where do you get them? You get them from Jesus, who is your inheritance. And how many Christians are, have inherited this thing, beautiful gift but aren't appropriating it? Okay, so let's start, because I've already spent too much time on the internet. That was all introduction-free no charge. Second Chronicles chapter 12, verse number 1, and I do apologize for the slide that's got it wrong. But anyway. When the rule of Rehoboam was established and he was strong, he abandoned the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. Well, Father, I pray that you just speak through me, that you would give me words of wisdom and knowledge and that you would speak into the hearts and lives of the people. And Lord, that we would hear from you and allow you to work your work of transformation in us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I underline things in my Bible. And I, and I know we live in a digital age. And you know, like I got like five Bibles on my iPhone. And I'm not saying that's bad. But I wish... You would have a Bible you could write in and write notes or figure some way. Maybe you can do that on your phone. I don't know, but I'm not that advanced. But, you know, something that you can work through stuff, underline, go back and read it and let it impact your heart. And, and one of the things I, I underlined was he was strong. He didn't get in trouble until he thought he had it all together, which goes back to what we were talking about was the pride issue. The pride issue says, man, hey, why are you messing up? It speaks to other people about their shortcomings because they feel so confident. But it's that very point at when we're strong that we don't realize our desperate need for Christ. What did he do? When he was strong, when he had it all together, when he had money in the bank, he was no longer dependent on the Lord. He abandoned the law of the Lord and all Israel followed him. And I don't understand why why it is that at times we... Uh, the, the, the very times of prosperity were distracted from the true source of that prosperity. See, we, you see, God is the source of it all. Everything we have, and we've got it, friends. We have because Christ has blessed us. And, and we live in this incredible nation. You know, I'm not saying America doesn't have any issues or problems or have done things wrong or made mistakes. We've done it all that. But still, I've lived all over the world, and there's no other place I would want to be a citizen of. We, we got it made. Our poor people have it better than, than anywhere in the world. And, and, and my point really is, sometimes what happens is, you know, when we're struggling, we're praying. You know, I had a friend who was a farmer in Colorado. He, he, uh, he grew pinto beans, dry land farming, so he had to depend on the rain, no irrigation. And he had thousands of acres, and I, I thought, and he told me that planting your crop brought, you, brought him to Christ. 
Because he said, you know what? Sometimes it don't rain. Sometimes it just seems like there is a famine in your land. And he said, what did he do? Kept him on his knees. Kept him on his knees. And then you plant and you get the rain and you wait for it to grow. And, 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 and all the time we come to the state of, of absolute dependence on God. And then even when you have the harvest, you got to depend that the price isn't going to drop below the cost of production. And he was just saying, praying and praying and praying. And I thought... You know, all of us have our experiences growing up. You know, how are we going to get the bills made? And, 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 and we sit there and we, man, we pray. I remember one of my kids was kind of struggling with something. And, and he, you know, not, not walking with Jesus. You know, these people say, how's he doing? I know well, he's working on his testimony. And uh, <laughs> he's working hard. <laughs> and um, one day I'm sitting there and I go, well, you know, I'm trying not, because, you know, when you're a pastor, you, everything becomes a sermon opportunity. And your kids just don't want to hear another sermon, you know. And so I'm trying to keep my mouth shut and be a good dad. And I'm like, you know, hey, well, you know, what do you think you're doing? Just, All you can do is pray. And I'm like, yes. Yes. You see why? Dependence drives you back to the realization that you all by yourself are not enough. But in Christ, you got more than enough. And when we get strong, we forget how needy we are. When we've got our act together, we don't need grace. Well, when we think <laughs> we've got our act together. Because see, there's the problem. We're like, hey, I've got it pretty together, which is when we're at our deepest sense of need because we're delusional. Just ask someone who knows you. <laughs> and so what is he saying? He said, man, at the point that I became strong, man, then they abandoned the law, and then I saw, and all Israel with him. When we see ourselves as strong, then we forget how desperately needy we are, and the king didn't just forget about God, but in his prosperity, he abandoned the law of the Lord, and then he led the whole nation with him. And I thought, you know what? We're all leading somebody. Is there anything more irritating than seeing your sins in your children? <laughs> or your spouse? <laughs> and you say, where, where did they get that? You don't want to know. Right? They get it from us. And what did he do? He let him downhill. And I, I, you know, you think, hey, I'm not leading anybody. But let me tell you, everybody here is leading somebody some way. And it's always easier to lead people downhill than uphill. People will fall you into the mud pit a lot quicker than they will to the heavens. And so what does he do? He's sitting there and he forgets and he leads them away. But look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. He says, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. And this is a pastoral prayer. This is how you know if it's a shepherd or not. You know, a lot of churches, it, what, what the temptation for a pastor is to become a rancher and not a shepherd. And if your pastor becomes a rancher, then what he's got to do is he's got he's to drive the program. He's got to get ahead, and he's got to, you know, he, he's, he's got to get them along. And it's all about the production. But a shepherd simply leads sheep at their own pace. And you hear here that the shepherd's heart, he says, having, my prayer is that your hearts would be enlightened, that you may know experientially what is the hope to which he has called you and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might. <clears throat> he said, I want you to understand that what you've inherited in Christ Jesus and I've asked you this before. Well, what was lacking in Jesus? Did Jesus have it all together and all that he ever needed? He, yeah. Was there anything lacking in Jesus? Come on, talk to me. 
No. But do you realize, friends, that you inherited Jesus to be your life? Jesus is not distant to you, living somewhere up in heaven. He's living in you. And he says, because you have Christ Jesus, you have inherited all there is to have, righteousness and redemption and sanctification and wisdom. You've got it all. And inheritances don't come through self-effort. Inheritances come through relationships. Look at verse 2 through 4. And in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, because they had been unfaithful to the Lord, Shishak, king of Egypt, came against Jerusalem with 1,200 chariots and 60,000 horsemen, and the people were without number who came with him from Egypt, Libyans, Sukkim, and Ethiopians, and he took the fortified cities of Judah, and he came as far as Jerusalem. So what happened was they've got it all together. They're living in abundance. They've got prosperity, and they abandon the Lord. We think if God just gave us enough, we would be faithful. Amen? They're all like, you're trying to sucker us into something. (laughs) Yes, I am. Isn't this the American dream? Aren't we all striving and working so that we can be independent? And I'm not saying you should live in your parents' basement the rest of your life. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that we have a, an ever-deepening dependence upon the Lord to realize our need for Him every day when we wake up. Because it's scary. Like, I look at friends and children and loved ones, and I sit there and I go, oh, I just, I want them to be blessed, and I want them (coughs) to prosper. I just don't want them to become presumptuous. Because money, as we're going to see, is a horrible master. And so they abandon the Lord, and God uses an Egyptian king to chastise Rehoboam. Pride always leads to loss. Write it down. Pride always leads to loss. And what does it do? Pride is why we have broken relationships. And pride is why our relationships remain broken. Because what is pride really all about? Me being right... And by default, amazing that you now knew that. (laughs) Yeah. It's obvious to us. Why? I mean, we we have this anytime you're in a marriage relationship, family relationship, work relationships, what happens? You get pride and you stand your ground because you're right and they're wrong. And if they're wrong, they've got to pay. Hitting some nerves this morning, right? And, and, and pride says, man, I am what it is all about. Why can't my spouse be a little more or a little less dysfunctional? Well, because they're married to you. You've created the monster you live with. What are you talking about? Pride says, no, I'm right, you're wrong, And then it causes a broken relationship, and pride says, you know what? I'm not saying I'm sorry because I'm not. You know what? I've heard even more mature things than that (laughs) from adults. I'll forgive them when they apologize. When they apologize, when they admit they're wrong, when they come clean, when they have paid the price, then I'll consider it. Do you see how antichrist it all is? It's just antichrist. 
he, he, he's saying, listen, it's just this pride that, that rips us. And I, rips us apart and creates this horrible, horrible loss. I mean, Egypt comes, and, and this, is the, this is the hard one for us. Like we're saying, like, why Egypt? I mean, like, we got our issues, but we're not Egypt. But God uses Egypt to chastise his children. And he doesn't bring chastisement into our lives to destroy us. He brings chastisement into our lives to restore us. Friends, look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 through 7. And he says, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? This is the beauty of, of Hebrews. I, I just love the whole book. <clears throat> He's addressing you as what? Sons. And when he, we, we use this and we think, oh, it's only the boys that count. No, that's... He's not. He's using this gender to describe. Because some people say man, and he doesn't mean just women are excluded. He means mankind, all of humanity. When he talks about us being born into Christ, he calls us all the sons, so that we receive culturally the full inheritance. So he's talking to you, and he's saying, "But look at," he says, "Don't forget this exhortation that addresses you as sons." So he's speaking to you not as aliens or unbeliever. He's speaking to you as the children of God. He says, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when, he, when reproved by him. Why? For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives, for it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Now, you're not going to believe this, but uh, 30-something years ago, Vanessa and I were quite enlightened. I mean, we were smart. We didn't have kids yet. But we knew what we were going to do when we had kids. And when we had Ryan, we were going to be the perfect parents. I mean, perfect. We weren't going to be hard on our kids like our parents were on us because we were enlightened. And I had this little beautiful son. I didn't have him. Vanessa had him. She did all the work. But I benefited from it. And, and I loved that kid. And I remember, you know, when he became two, the reason they called it the terrible, I was trying to negotiate with a two-year-old. <laughs> no, no, no. Daddy says stop. He'd be like, what? <laughs> and the kid was fast. <laughs> One day, I just remember this vividly, Ryan is bolting and a car is coming and I said, Ryan, stop. And he keeps running and I screaming at the loudest, stop. And, you know, I realized, listen, there's a problem. He doesn't respect authority. And it's going to get him killed. See, in my mind, I thought by not disciplining him, because my dad kind of went overboard sometimes. Not, not a little overboard. I mean, if he got mad, man, he was, he was beating you out of anger, and you were running for your life, and, and, and it gives you this distorted view of how God disciplines you. But what I realized with Ryan that day was, man, listen, if, if, if he doesn't learn to respect me saying he's going to end up dead hit by a car... And the question is, do you love the kid enough to lovingly discipline? And I taught him to come to the place where like, when dad said, stop, you stop. It was painful for me. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, he, he, he got a few slaps on the rear end, and, and he learned to stop. And I saw that as he grew up. He was like, he learned to kind of respect the authority was there not to destroy him, but to help him to save his life. And the Lord is saying to you, listen, I know that you don't like being disciplined by me, but remember, it's proof that you're a child. And God disciplines you and he disciplines me all in different ways that are perfectly suited to be expressions of his love for us because every kid you have is different. Like I had one kid that was stubborn and it didn't matter what you did, they, they just blow you off. 
You know, I mean, seriously, like, people, you read a stupid book about breaking their will, and I'm like, what? I'm exhausted. <laughs> anyway, what does God do it for? Because he loves us. And I thought, well, by not disciplining, I'm showing that I love them, and, and I'm really endangering them. One kid needs a lot of attention. Uh, uh, one kid needs a lot of stimulation of the, the rear end. <laughs> one kid we had, you looked at her wrong. I, I just blew it. I narrowed it down to two. <laughs> sorry. You look at wrong, and they're like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all you needed to do. Tender, compliant. Thank God for kids like that. But it was all what? To be an expression of love. N nobody finds discipline pleasant, but it's so necessary to remind us how self-destructive our self-will lives can be. And I'm just going to, I throw this out there in first service, throw it out again. Listen, if you go through life and we all have our periods of rebellion, we have periods of rebellion and periods of pride, which is just an obnoxious sin. It puts us in opposition to God because we don't realize how desperately needy we are in grace. We begin to look down and, and to despise other people and judge ourselves better than other people. And he's saying it's offensive to God because all of us are in desperate need of his grace. His grace should never stop amazing us. And when it stops amazing us, we need to kind of get a new vision of who God is because all of a sudden we're forgetting how messed up we are. No one in here has time to focus on the problems of another person because you have plenty of your own. But I will say this, if you go through life and all of your rebellions and struggles against God and there's never any discipline in your life, I start saying, are you a child of God? I do because I just sit there now. Sometimes it's secret to me and I don't make it, but listen, Examine your heart. Are you his child? Because if you're his child, he loves you. And that means teaching you. And we need to realize that, you know, grace isn't the license to sin because people always say, I mean, you know, you talk about grace too much and people are going to sin. I'm like, no, people are sinning very well already. <laughs> grace did not make them sin more. But grace empowers you to live a life free from the penalty of sin. And people who tell me, well, you know, grace, I can sin all I want because of grace. <sighs> That's just dumb. He's saying to you, he, if you're my child, I love you. And man, I'll do whatever is necessary so that you know how much I love you. And, and some of my discipline raising my kids was out of frustration was inappropriate. I had to go back and apologize to him and say, listen, you know, sometimes I just got frustrated and I blew it. And I'm sorry, because that's not why God disciplines, not in anger. Always intentional, always focused, always an expression of love, whatever that discipline looks like. Look at verse 5 and 6. Then Shemaiah and the prophet came to Rehoboam and to the princes of the Judah who had gathered at Jerusalem because of Shishak, and said to them, Thus saith the Lord, You abandoned me, so I have abandoned you to the hand of Shishak. Then the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves and said, The Lord is righteous. Now, it's really hard for us because as the covenant children of God, we, who does God use to discipline us? The people more worser than us. Sure. Well, you know it's true. You said, well, you're like, that ain't fair. Why, why in the world is that, per you, you know, and it doesn't make sense to us. And we'll hear people say, and we have said maybe, you know, like, I don't, I don't understand. How could a loving God allow this? Or we go even a step farther and say, how could a loving God do this? I don't believe in any kind of God who will allow this. And you know the problem with all that is it's, it's little us, little ants crawling on the ground trying to figure out what's going on in the world. I mean, have you ever worked for someone that was just a complete idiot? 
I mean, especially, can go back to like when you were 21 and you knew everything? No, you're serious. Like, you know, when you're 21, you know everything. I did. I'm sure you did too. I mean, everything is like crystal clear, right? You know, like right, wrong, good, bad, you know, and some stuff your boss did or the owner of the company. It's just stupid. And then as you grow older and you become the boss, you start to realize, oh, my gosh. There are other reasons that were not completely clear to me at 21 that now make clarity, and I'm starting to understand why they did what they did. It's true of kids with their parents, right? I mean, when you're, when you're, when you're 13, you know, God help us, how do people be live? I, I know my kids, they look at me, they're like, how could a man that old and that stupid actually function? They didn't say it to my face, but that, you know, that's what they're thinking. And then my kids have kids, and it's just a beautiful thing. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. Like, my, one of my girls is just like, you know, I remember one time she's like, Mom, is this payback? <laughs> Vanessa, in her beautiful wit, I mean, this girl, spontaneous, quick. She goes, not yet, sweetie. <laughs> One of my teenage granddaughters does something wrong, getting in trouble, and I hear the news like it was horrible, and I'm like. (laughs) (laughs) But we say, how could a loving God do this? But see, but my point is we don't understand. And God is not the cause of all things in the sense that he's causing this, but he allows these things to go on in, as an expression of our love so that we understand that even the wrath of God is an expression of God's love. Don't look at, the, at God's wrath or his anger or his discipline or his persecution through the lens of your own father. God acts purposefully to express his love for us, and he disciplines us, and he teaches us, and he molds us because he has promised to conform us to his vision. But it's always, always, always an act of love, and he never abandons. In the old covenant, you were in and out. My whole religious system, you know, up until God revealed his grace to me, was just like, you're always in and out. You receive Jesus, God's in you sin, God's out. For some of us, that's like, well, all day long, in and out. Or every week, in and out. Because in the old covenant, it was a conditioned covenant, and God said, here's your part, here's my part, you do your part, I'll do my part. And so what he's even saying there, he said, listen, you abandoned me, and so... In the new covenant, God says, okay, here's your part, here's my part. I'll do your part, I'll do my part. You say, really? He does our part? Yeah, he knows us. And so we have a security that he'll never abandon us. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. And he's working all of these things to bring us to the place of repentance, which means a change of mind or a change of direction. He's trying to change how we know what we know about ourselves and what we think about ourselves and how we believe. And then it says, and they humbled the south and said, the Lord is righteous. Now, is humility like the hardest thing? Like you can't manufacture it yourself, true humility. You can't. But let me remind you that humility is not thinking badly of yourself. That kind of humility is a, another kind of pride because who's it consumed with? with self. I mean, you thought about it? I'm no good. I'm horrible. I'm no good. I'm no good. I'm just no good. Who are we talking about? I. I'm awesome. I'm wonderful. I mean, they're really the same thing. They're self-consumed. But humility isn't thinking bad of yourself. Humility is is recognizing that all by myself, I'm empty. And so is everybody else. And we're not, we stop confessing or comparing our sins with someone else. But then he says these beautiful words. He says, the Lord is righteous. Now, 
we go back and we say, we see stuff, and you've all done it, or I imagine you have. You've all done something, and you said, that's not righteous. That's not good. Why does that happen? Have you never asked? Why this person died? Why that person got cancer? Why I got Parkinson's? Why you got your... And we say, we say, why? But then I started thinking about this, and I was like, no, 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 no. That's, that's just going to confuse my brain. I humble myself, and I say, you know what I am? I'm a child in the hand of God, and he is righteous. When you're sick, he's righteous. And when you're well, he's righteous. And when you're wealthy, he's righteous. And when you're poor, he's righteous. And when life is good, he is righteous. And yet when life seems stinky, he's righteous. Because he alone is the sovereign God, the worker, the creator and sustainer of the universe. And he's using my illness and my health, my wealth and my poverty to live and bring all of these things together, to work together for good, to conform me to his image. And I don't understand why, but I trust that the Lord is righteous. Man thinks his own way is right. I just thought of it. I don't know what that has to do with anything. But I am just constantly amazed at your ability to rationalize. I mean, people come to the pastor all the time, and they have rationalized their sin. And they come to me sometimes, and they're like, so what do you think? Cool? And I'm like, Sounds like a dumb plan to me. I mean, you rebel against God. It don't seem smart to me. I'm sorry, because the Lord is righteous, and you may rationalize and rationalize and rationalize to do whatever you want to do, but the Lord's righteous. And every bit of righteousness that I have comes from him through my inheritance. Look at Hebrews 13, 5. Keep your life free from the love of money. What does it say? What's the admonition? Keep your life, your life, your way of living free from what? It doesn't mean money. It says the love of money, which is the occupation, which tends to be the occupation of the Western world. Because we have lied ourselves into thinking that there is a certain amount that is enough. You guys don't want to talk about it? I mean, I got no expression, just blank stares. Pastor, please, I'll pay you. Go on. No, this is what it's all about, right? We're all working to get to that place that doesn't exist enough. And what is he saying? Don't let your life become preoccupied with the obsession about money as though money were going to be your security. He says, listen, because I will never leave you or forsake you. And what happens to us is we all kind of get in this rat race of the American life trying to earn enough and store enough away to make sure that we have security Because we forget the Lord says, listen, you can't trust that stuff. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so in my head, you know, years now, I've been trying to live in such a way that I would give enough and be generous enough that every week I'd have to be dependent. Because I'm afraid that I'll rely on my own abilities. I'm afraid I'll rely on my seminary training and my experience and not trust and depend on Christ to speak through me. And I'm afraid that if I got enough squirreled away, I'd find security where there is no security. And he's saying, listen, don't love money. I'm not saying money is bad. Money is a good tool to advance the kingdom of God. Just don't fall in love with it. It's a deceiver. It's a lying mistress. Second Timothy 2.13, we'll stop with this. He says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. I, I'm, I'm already out of time. i got to stop, but I love this verse. Because this sums up the problem. And, 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 and listen. We live in a culture that says, if you're faithful to me, I'll be faithful to you. 
And do you know that's why the divorce rate in the church is the same as outside of the church? Because the church world, the believing world, feels the same way about life as the unbelieving world. We have developed, in some sense, this Christian humanism where it's all about us and how about we feel and what we like. And we say, I'll be faithful to you as long as you're faithful to me. And once you break in that, I'm out of here. I'm not advocating infidelity at all. Hear me. It has consequences that are destructive, all kinds of infidelities. But I'm saying, listen, look at what God says to you. He doesn't love you. He doesn't stick with you. He doesn't promise to never leave you nor forsake you because you're faithful. Was there anybody who actually sits here in this Bible-believing church and says, you know what, Pastor, I just want to give a testimony today. I'm 100% faithful all the time. I never blow it. I never live self-willed life. I never... Anybody here? Good, we can go to baptism. <laughs> well, I'm serious. And you know, you say, how could he be faithful to me? I'm so unfaithful. It had nothing to do with you. You know, like, yeah, your kids are doing something that's embarrassing at Walmart, and you say, oh, not my child, his mother's child. <laughs> oh, we'd be tempted to deny, right? Oh, God's never going, oh. He says, I'll never deny you because I can't deny me, and you're hidden in. Isn't that awesome? He says, you and I have nothing to worry about in Christ if we put our trust in him because it's not us all alone. It's us living from our inheritance and we are hidden in Christ and, and he sees us and he sees Jesus because we are the temple of the living God. And that ought to just transform everything. It's so amazing. He tells the Corinthians, he says the Corinthians, which were just living like crazy people, he goes to them and he says, you know, if you go into a prostitute, you take Jesus into a prostitute. You take me into a prostitute. You watch porn, Jesus is watching porn. He said, what? You, you, you see what I'm saying? It should just like wake us up. Everywhere I go and everything I do, Jesus is with me. And he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, even when you sin. Now, I don't know. That reality doesn't make me want to go out and sin. Wakes me up to the realization, man, everything I'm looking at, he's looking at with me. Everywhere I go, he's going with me. And he says, I will never leave you. Now, are there consequences for bad choices? Yeah, and they're painful, and yet they're all designed to be expressions of his love to conform us to his image. He will allow you to suffer the consequences of sinful choices and rebellion against him, but he will never leave you or forsake you. <clears throat> he might use someone you think is much more worse than you. To bring about that. But the Lord is righteous. When I got money in the bank, he's righteous. When I don't know how I'm going to pay the electric bill, he's righteous. And when my health was great, he's righteous. And when it's the other it is, he's righteous. In good, he's righteous. In difficulty, he's righteous. Father, thank you for these dear people, and I pray that you bless them, that you just keep transforming us into your image. Thank you for loving us. I pray that you bless in Jesus' name. Amen.